Um, good evening, everybody. It has been quite an eventful day for anybody that deals with technology. Um, I had um, all of my internet down until about two today because of some improvements they're making. And then Amazon Web Service went down, which meant we had no go to meeting until about four o'clock. So we've been, and no Zoom. <laughs> So we were kind of dead in the water yeah. a little bit for today. but Made us a little nervous. A little nervous about getting this webinar in place, but here we are. And this is called Emergent Literacy Playing with Books. And I will tell you the inspiration for this idea of playing with books is because I have a one-year-old granddaughter named Mila. And um, her mom was clever enough to catch her, like, exploring a book. Um, I sent the video to David Copenhaver and said, you got to check this out. And um, we had a long discussion about just the idea of how important it is for kids to play with books. And she's got it upside down, right side up. She's pointing to the pictures. She's putting her finger along the text. Um, not understanding that text is text, but she's seen enough people do that. And so it always gets my brain thinking. My, gr my grandchildren are the inspiration for most of what I do because I think I kind of did it when I had four kids, I wasn't thinking Rhett um, at that time. Um, and now I'm solidly entrenched and that's all I think. Um, and so when I see her doing something, I think about how we can do that for our kiddos that can't use their hands. So thus, this um, webinar. And I am Susan Norwell, um, co-founder of Rhett University, and I am happy to be with you this evening. And with me is my right arm. Go ahead, Courtney. <laughs> Hi everyone, I am Courtney Barnum and I am an educational specialist working with Miss Susan and also a Rett sibling. Um, my sister Christy lived with Rett syndrome for 51 years. So there we go and, and I'd be lost without Courtney so I'm just really glad she's on board. Um, we I, mutually love each other. We, 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 we have love fest. <laughs> we really do. So I'll tell you what, you you read the quote for the picture and I'll read the one from David Yoder because David Yoder, and you know what? David Yoder just died recently. He just died a couple months ago. Did he really? He did. Oh. He had a nice full life. So that was good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I, I, I love quotes and I love all... Reading is one of my favorite things in the whole wide world, so um, I always try to find really great reading quotes. And this one says, reading is a passport to countless adventures. And I really think for, especially for our kiddos, personal story, when I was young and was learning how to read, I um, had a really amazing, really amazing second grade teacher who pushed that love of reading with me. And I absolutely just loved reading and it became my place to escape to. And so when I think about our kids who don't always have the ability to do everything because of their bodies, because of Rhett, I think Rhett syndrome, I think books let them go places where they don't always, that they, they can get to in their own imagination. And I think so that when I saw that one as a passport to countless adventures, I was like, I love that. It's a good one. And David Yoder very wisely said, no student is too anything to be able to read and write. So nobody can tell you, oh, your kiddo is too delayed, or your kiddo is too impaired, or your kiddo is too um, distracted, or the list goes on and on. I hear it all the time in IEP meetings, and really no student can be, can be taken out of this equation um, unless the person working with them doesn't know how to teach reading and writing to more complex kiddos or doesn't have a belief system that says they should learn to read and to write. So that both of those well, things are problematic. <laughs> right. Susan, it's really interesting because I'm actually, I got that quote out of the book that I'm reading for my course. And there's a whole story that goes along with it. it from what I understand, when his son Eric was five, he asked, can I go out and play? It's not to anything. And his mother replied, what do you mean? It's not to anything. And he, the son explained, it's not too windy. It's not too rainy. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It's not too anything. And so that's where he got the whole idea of it's not, no child is too anything to be able to read and write. That's and I, like, I never knew that part of it. I thought that was so cool. That is very cool. Um, we're taking a look at emergent reading. So we're looking at where littles would begin. Um, 
So what is it? Um, all of the reading and writing behaviors and understanding that precedes the development of conventional reading. So everything that comes before somebody picking up a pencil or an adapted pencil or a flip book in writing or picking up a, and when I say picking up, accessing a book and are able to read it, anything before that would be emergent reading. So there is a continuum that begins just before birth as um, there's research by Moon on 20, in 2017 that they really do understand in utero different forms of language awareness. I read a, a study also that um, had the moms read a certain book to their kiddo while they were pregnant. And then after the baby was born, they would read that book and two other books. And the heart rate changed in the babies of, to the book that the mom had read in utero. So they were recognizing the familiarity. So you know, you can't be, you can't, you don't even have to be born to be on the continuum of immersion reading. That's some pretty low bar there. So uh, let's just remember that. Um, and it never ceases to be relevant. And so we write goals all the time. And, and at RETU, we adhere to SMART goals. There's, there's um, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time constraint. So they are relevant. It's so important that we write things that are relevant because um, I've seen some goals that just don't make any sense to me in any shape or form. Um, functions of literacy are as important as the forms so that they need to be engaged in exploring reading, using re reading and writing in real world context from the start. And so you know, we're, we're signing birthday cards and, and little Mila at one will give her something so that she can mark her name on the card, you know, make her mark. Um, and even if a kid who can't hold a pencil, they can tell us what they want to write if they look at some letters on their device. Or if they, if we ask them and say, would you like, you know, mommy, would you like Susan to hold your hand and help you? And they say, yes, we can always help them. So it's really important for them to see how we integrate reading and writing into our daily life. When we're making lists, we can say, what would you like to put on the list at the grocery store? And kiddos that have an ABC flip book, we can just, you know, they go ZXY and we go, okay, we'll look for one of those when we get in the store. You know, and maybe the Z and we get there and say, oh, well, there's some zucchinis here. Were you interested in zucchinis? That starts with Z. And so they may say no and we'll say, okay, well, that might not be it. We'll figure it out next time. But the reality is, is those marks they make or those letters they choose or those things that they point to with their eyes in a book have to have meaning. We make meaning for them. Um, must be active and interactive engagement with books and writing. So it's not a rote pump and dump kind of a thing where I'm going to read a page and you are going to tell me, you know, answer all the WH questions in this book or I'm going to write something and you're going to write just what I wrote, which is called copying, not really writing. So just being able to take a look at what emergent reading is, and this is from the book that um, that um, Courtney was, was alluding to, which is called Comprehensive Literacy, Comprehensive for, Literacy for, for All. all. For all. Um, and um, it's a great book. A great book. Um, it's, I've got a couple of them on my shelf. Um, one that I've read and then one I pass out to other people so they can read it. So that's good. All right. So playing with books. Um, it's really, when you look at this baby up at the top, what you see is them just kind of pawing at the book. They don't really understand the front, the back, the upside down. You look at this little girl holding the book so nicely, perfectly upside down, but she's seen people hold it. And so we, we're in a situation where this holding and turning of the page and, and, and having a book upside down or right side up is a little bit harder because we don't have the same hand use available to our kiddos. But thanks to the, um, the, the beauty of, of electronics and technology these days, we can put books on a device so that they can look at them and they can make the pages turn. And for my littles, uh, my little littles, not my, I, I have some videos of like four and five year olds and three year olds, but for my littles, if they're like two, I would give them freedom to go back and forth in a book. Now, by the time I'm really trying to teach a little bit of more format of reading, I might not give them that option to go backwards. Um, but certainly in the beginning, they would have that ability. And the books that we design also hotspot the pictures. You'll see what that is like in a minute. So that when they look at the picture, it lights up 
So we know what they're interested in. So their eyes are their pointer finger. We have to remember how important that is um, as we go through this. All right, so go ahead, um, Courtney. Well, there's Olive. Oh, when I saw look at Olive. Isn't what? She so, look at Olive. Isn't she so cute? <laughs> I know. So I cute. was pulling up that picture. I was like, oh my gosh, she's so little. I know. All right. So how do we recreate some of these same experiences for students with expense, extensive support needs? And again, getting some of this information out of the comprehensive literacy book, um, because what I found for some of these things are they, they're so important to our kids. And even though our kids maybe can't hold the books like my great nieces can, they can still interact with the books. Yep. And some of the things that I have seen, and I think Susan and I both see within our practice is these things are the, the, some of the biggest, the bigger effects of success. Um, presuming potential. Very first thing, my, our girls know that we believe in them. Our girls and boys know that we believe in them and that we believe that they can learn. And so they are much more willing to kind of show us what they know because they've got that. Doing that shared reading, interaction, you know, reading the book as we're looking at the book together. And I'm watching um, Gay's Viewer on the Toby has become one of my very favorite things, especially when we're doing books, because I can see where the girls and boys eyes are going. And so I'll be like, oh, I see that you're looking at this picture. And because I'm noticing where they're going, they're looking in more places. They're interacting more with the book because I'm making comments about it. Um, establishing an environment for successful literacy learning. I, there's 10 elements and we're gonna go over these in the next page um, for success. But environment is so important. When I was teaching, um, I had a very much a, literacy filled room and we had lots of books and we had lots of interactions with books and things like that and it was fun and we had a lot of good times with it and i think that brings out the reader more than anything and that goes into that second one have fun with the reading i get silly when i read with my girls and boys i try to you know find those engaging books find the great you know find great pictures that go with the books um find ways for them to engage with the book and let them make silly comments. I think that's the thing that I have found one of the, with my girls and boys is when we do silly voices and we do silly comments about the book, that gets them 10 times more engaged because they want me to continue making the silly voices and they want to continue making the silly comments. And I love when they give me the silly comments. It is, it makes your day, doesn't it? Um, so establishing this environment, I think is something that, um, probably all teachers need to really think about in the classroom. You know, we had this kind of behavioral model come into special education classrooms in particular in around the, the 80s, 70s, 80s. Um, and it became more of a the teacher at the front of the room or the teacher at the front of the interaction being the one that is leading it and expecting a response. But if kids are really going to be engaged in literacy and, and writing literacy learning, it has to be an equal back and forth. It has to be this reciprocity that's established. There's actually research that shows the reciprocity in reading a book with a child is like pretty perfect in terms of turn taking. Um, and it builds that back and forth that kids need to have if they're gonna learn other things. Um, and, and what happens oftentimes in schools, it becomes so didactic. It's just like, okay, here we are. We're gonna impart all this stuff to you and the kid never gets a turn. And, and what happens is they lose their interest, not because they're not smart enough, but because when you think about our kids with RET, it's very hard for many of them to stay regulated and engaged. They are on seizure meds, they're sitting in a wheelchair, and the wheelchair makes them feel more sleepy because they can't move around, or they're one of those kids that's a walker who just doesn't know how to stop. They're just constantly moving. And, and so this idea of building this back and forth reciprocity is at the cornerstone of what they're ever gonna learn going up the road. And we have to be more knowledgeable about looking at kids as partners so that we see them and involve them as active participants, not like a tabula rosa or an empty vase that we're just pouring stuff into. That just doesn't work. Um, it's really important that if we are going to interact with kids that don't have hand use, 
that we read all of their communication. We read their facial expressions. We read their body language. We read where they are trying to get to on their devices, where they do get to on their devices. And so it's very essential that you have a way to communicate because you cannot learn to read if you can't communicate. The two of them go hand in hand. It's really important. This idea of repetition with variety. I think teachers, I've been in at least three IEP meetings in the last three weeks where they kept saying they need a lot of repetition to learn. And I said, can we change that? They don't need repetition to learn. They're really smart. And if you try and make them do the same thing over and over again, they're going to like look at you and say, forget it. I already told you that's the letter T and I really don't want to tell you that three more times. So you can check it off on your list. But this repetition with variety means I can find out about the letter T in lots of different ways. I do not have to do it the same way. And then I can make sure that they know it and move on. And then this cognitive engagement, one of the things that I think our kids lose out on is this persistent effort into the me mental processes of thinking, reasoning, judgment. Because, because they're limited in what they can do motorically, we're not saying to them, you know, I'm having trouble finding my shoes. And if you say this to a little kid who's walking and who understands what a shoe is, they're going to start looking and trying to figure out where the shoe is. Our kids, or, or I'll say, go tell daddy. I can remember saying, go tell daddy. It's time for dinner. Tell him to get up and let's go to dinner. They have to hold that in their brain. They have to get there. They have to remember it and pull it out and get it. So look at all the things that our kids don't really get to practice. And I, and I know when, sometimes when I talk to parents, I say, you know, you could say to your daughter, um, can you tell daddy that I need the carrots? They're sitting at the table. And so the little girl would look at daddy and say, oh, thanks for getting daddy's attention about the carrots. So that they're thinking about telling somebody something and what they're going to tell them. I'm not saying they have to on their device, fine, daddy, give me mom the carrots. They just need that expectation that they are gonna be part of the thinking and the reasoning that's going on around us. And then cognitive clarity is a lucid understanding that they can that can lead to learning. Like, what is in this for me? I can remember kids saying to me, I don't want to do making words. I think making words is boring. In fact, I had this girl who was like, didn't want to do the rhyming, just did not want to do the rhyming. You know, this is boring. I don't like it. I don't want to do it. And then we started having to transfer words, and she had to start reading books that had words for her to decode. And then I showed her how the words she couldn't decode rhymed with a word she knew and all of a sudden she was like I got it I got it this is smart this is good this is excellent and I'm like see it's not it may feel boring at first but when you figure out the reason why we're doing it it's way more interesting okay so and cognitive clarity and cognitive clarity for younger kids is like hey she's going to be happy when I do it you know it's not it's right. not quite that complicated and for our teenagers I, and our older, our more mature young ladies, I think it's because we still do have some girls and boys who are emergent, even though they're older. And it is very funny because one of the things I've started talking with them is about texting and emailing and things like that. And I'll be like, I have a young lady who has a boyfriend right now. And I'm like, uh, you don't want your mom and dad reading your text messages or writing your text messages for you, do you? So it's finding that what's in it for me. And let me tell you, with our teenagers, that is a big draw for them because they're like, oh, yes, I want to write my own things. Thank you very much. So that's a good way to bring them into the into that. Okay. Do you want to do this next slide? Sure. I did Establishing a, an yeah. environment for... Go I, ahead. I did two slides because it was so tiny. I wanted everybody to see this. This is such important yes. stuff here. Yes. Establishing an environment for successful literacy learning. Continuing this. Connection to what is being read. Students with disabilities learn better when they feel a sense of belonging and connection. I can not only see this with my clients that I work with now, but I also can see it when I was teaching. And we would do book studies. Actually, after I started um, being trained by Susan, I went back and changed my whole classroom for students with autism, CP, um, Down syndrome, things like that, and started doing book studies. I was, I was, we were developed, uh, we were departmentalized and I was a language arts teacher. <laughs> And I started doing book studies with my kiddos and the, and I did not read, we did not read baby books. We were reading middle school chapter books because I was teaching middle school and 
we the connections that they were making and the because they were part of the book they were part of the choosing of the books they were part of the they were they were part of everything so once they have that connection and that belonging they will so very much get much more involved in their reading encouragement of risk taking and i think i i highlighted the ones that were really i think very important to our kids this is a huge one huge. i have watched going in with my i've worked going both you know what most of my students we, when we started i have been remote and i have now started traveling again for the for us and going and seeing some of our clients in in schools and seeing my kiddos in schools and it's funny because we see them remotely we're working with them we're doing things we're you know we're they were taking risks i get to school and i'm hearing that they're not doing the same things they're doing you know they're or they're not showing the same things that they're showing me it's at home when i'm doing remotes with them and one of the things i think part of it is is i'm we try to really create that safety net of okay it's okay to take risks and make mistakes because our girls and boys i don't know if you guys have seen this our girls and boys seem to really hate making mistakes they do um they're <laughs> they're a little, they're little perfectionists and so trying to help them realize that it's okay that it's a safe place where they can make take that risk to not be perfect to to take some risks in what they're doing and it really is a payoff and that is like you take nothing else from there i think that's the biggest one for me is that encouragement of risk taking and that they feel safe to take the risk so i remember reading this so my master's is in um behavior disorders and part of that is edbd was my background um and for the kids that have emotional issues they said that reading is hard because they they can't take risks that they're too anxious to take risks. Learning to read and learning to write is a risk-taking adventure. Yes. And you see the difference. I even see the difference in my own children when they were growing up. The ones that really were nervous to make a mistake struggled because you have to make a lot of mistakes before you learn to read. You make a lot of mistakes when you're learning to write. And the kid that was like, oh, I made a mistake, move on. That was the one that developed reading and writing much easier because they weren't so caught up in that anxiety piece. And I think that our kiddos have a huge dose of anxiety because their body mm -hmm. is betraying them all the time. And so trying to help them have a little bit of self-talk around this and be able to say, you know, I know this is hard and I know it's new and I know I'm going to make mistakes, but it's going to be okay. Um, I think is a really important piece of that risk taking. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Comprehension instruction. Um, this is something, and I'm going to be very honest, I saw it for very many years, not in my classroom, but in other classrooms of, of other teachers that I worked with when I was teaching, is very, very much rote. And that we were, it was, we were focusing on IEP goals and we were focusing on this and we were focusing, but we weren't teaching the full gamut of literacy to make sure that all things were being taught. We were just going for rote learning, which is not fun, number one, and it's not comprehensive. So it does not really teach them literacy. Um, significant time allocation, making sure that we have them engaged in self-selective reading, but also, um, you know, in self-directed, or I'm sorry, in guided reading, shared reading. And one of the things I found in the research is that time engaged in self-selected reading benefits readers of all ability, ability I'm sorry, I can't talk. Ability levels, um, which I thought, which I knew, but to see it in the research is just huge because I think sometimes people think that our more complex or more extensive support students don't need that time. And, you know, like I know time. as a teacher, I had principals who said, oh, well, you don't need the full two hours for reading instruction. Yes, I do. Yeah. My students deserve it just as much as anybody else. And then of course, high expectations. Um, using that least dangerous assumption, be, meaning that we're assuming they are capable of learning the literacy skills and communication. What is it going to hurt them if we teach them? It is not going to do damage to them. Not teaching them and not teaching them how to read and write is going to damage them. Yeah, and so and, we have to think about the functionality of writing for our kiddos is that, and adults is that they can tell us exactly what they're thinking. That's a huge payoff. And not to not to spend the time when they're little. I just got a, sat with a family in um, New Zealand, um, just diagnosed, little two-year-old. And we were talking about 
what, where to start, what could they do. And I gave them some grids to start with so they could start modeling language, but I also talked about book reading. I said, this is the, you know, the three ways that our kids are gonna to learn to communicate are through everyday experiences where we're using language, through play and interaction, where we're gonna help them pretend play and, and, and talk to us about, communicate with us about what they wanna do. They may not be able to pick up that baby and burp it, but they can communicate that that's something they wanna do and we can help them. And the other is through books. Um, they teach language in, in a way that we know that's the case. Every kid who comes to school, if they've been read to, has a better chance of being a reader and a writer. So really important that they get the time before they go to school um, and that we push for it when they do go to school. So if your kiddo yes. is in preschool, if your kiddo's in early intervention, EI, they're two, they're three years old, and those people are coming to your house and they're not reading to them, there's something wrong. If your kiddo is in preschool and they are not figuring out a way for them to interact with books, not just sit in a, in a, in a group of 10 kids and be read to, which is hardly interactive, um, but if they're not figuring out a way to make the books accessible to them and to, and to be noticing what they can and they cannot do, to notice that they look at the pictures, that they actually are looking at the words, that they actually are um, looking to the left side of the page when you turn the page because they know that's where you're going to read next and then they shift their gaze to the right. I think that one of the things that we've learned um, from our kiddos with complex needs is that we have to be better observers of the little things mm -hmm. they are doing so that we can build that into more conventional literacy skills, but also how affirming is that for the child that we just noticed, whoa, you know right where mommy is going to start reading, over here on this side. If we notice those things, then it helps them know that what they're doing, for lack of a better word, is right. Do you know what I'm saying? They're not getting a lot of feedback from their bodies. Let us be their feedback which I think is really important. Okay, so I'm looking at the time here and we're like waxing eloquently, but you got to show a movie and I've got two to show, so let's rock and roll here. Right. Oh, here, I have to actually turn the All movie right, on. So you, <laughs> okay, you're going to give them a this lead is, <laughs> Yes, this is Ava, and this was last year when I first started with her. So she was just, so she, she just turned four. I started working with her when she had just turned three. She's got a full robust communication system on her device and we were doing read aloud just to get her to interact. And what I want you to see is how, playing very simply is just her making comments and me responding to what she's doing and being silly in the reading. And that just is getting her involved in the books. And it's so, you know, to see her, it, it's funny. I said to her mom when I asked her if I could use this clip, it is amazing to see the growth that she has made in this past year. Like from that video to like, I just saw her last week. And just the, oh my gosh, I was like, I was like so excited because she's made so much growth in her reading, in her, she loves books. When I first started with her, she didn't want to sit still for five minutes. And now she sits for a full hour and reads with me and we're interacting with books. So this is her just doing us beginning, starting with writing. Uh, yes, he's very busy. He's a busy, busy, busy spider. Kind of like you today where you had a busy day. Mm -hmm. Are you ready? <laughs> Are you ready? Yes. We're going to the green. We say, I'm ready, Courtney. All right, I'm going to take us back to core words. Actually, I'm going to take us to our topics page, my love, and I'm going to take us to school and reading. All right. And Miss Ava, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do... Oh, you're happy. Okay. I don't... I hope you're sad. I hope you're not sad. You think the spider might be sad? We're going to read four pages, and then we'll take a break. Okay? Four pages, and then we'll take a break. Early one morning, the wind blew a spider across the field. You're right. Something happened. That wind blew the spider. I'm sure he was very tired. A thin, silky thread trailed from her body. The spider landed on a fence post near a farmyard. And there she goes. <laughs> she's like, she's like so excited she's going to fly out of her chair. Okay, so this is Zoe. 
And this is Zoe at three, just about to turn four. And I'm trying to give her a way to just play with reading a book. This is the first time she's ever read a book. And it's set up um, on her Toby, on her iSeries i13. And the these little boxes here that you see on the pictures, they light up when she looks at them. And the text or the icons light up. I have them set to light up when she looks at them also. Unfortunately, they don't light up when I touch them. That's a limitation in Communicator and it's a limitation in Snap. It's not a limitation in Grid. The grid will allow that to happen. Um, so let's take a look at this. See, see, see a butterfly. Look at the top. It says, Hello, butterfly. Hello, butterfly. Hello, butterfly. There you go. Hello, Hello, butterfly. Butterfly. I know, is it pretty? Pretty. Oh, pretty it's pretty. Pretty. A pretty butterfly that's so amazing. Amazing. Hmm, what do you think? Hello. Hello, butterfly. Right, that's the title. Hello, butterfly. <laughs> that's exactly right. Yes, you found the title. You can well see, see, you can see where it says hello, hello. and butterfly. butterfly up at the top. Hello, butterfly. And look at the boy is looking so carefully at that butterfly with a magnifying glass. Then it makes it look a little bit bigger. Hello, butterfly. Mm -hmm. Hello, amazing. butterfly. It, it is amazing <laughs> and pretty. You it's are it. right. So she's really just exploring the book. Um, does she know Hello, Butterfly is the title? No, she saw me point to it. So now she's pointing to it with her eyes. If I was reading it with a neurotypical kiddo and I pointed to it and they pointed to it, it wouldn't be because I think that they know what the title is. It's they're imitating. They're starting to learn what you do with books. And so for Zoe, she's got all these interactions now around what reading a book is. And as she went into kindergarten, the kindergarten teachers were amazed. They're like, oh my gosh, she's tracking print left to right. You know, she went from just looking at the pictures to looking at the words and then finally putting the words all in a row and like looking all the way across the text, knowing you start on the left. It's this gradual acquisition of meaningful skills. And um, I'm convinced that uh, the methodology that we use um, is why we have so many kids reading, is because we kind of start out with this very systematic approach to giving them experience with playing with books before we ever expect them to read a book. All right, go ahead there, Court. All right, this is Hallie, and again, we are, um, this is her, so kind of like Susan, this is when we were just starting um, reading with her, she, you know, getting her used to getting on that page, or getting on the book and doing some, you know, playing with it by herself and just interacting with the book. Because again, like Susan says, getting that interaction on that book is huge. And watching where her eyes go on the pictures and things like that and making comments to it helps her get more engaged in the book. Good reading. Right, let's check out that picture. <gasps> Look at those beautiful elephants. Yeah, that's the mommy elephant. That's right. That's the mommy elephant. That's right. You got it. That's a mama elephant. That's right. Mom and. I'll wait for you to get your eyes up there. It's okay. We're reading. You're real cute. <laughs> <laughs> I like the little ha ha that she's like, yeah, I know, I'm so you cute. And I'm going to, you know. Hallie. But we were working on that left to right, too, getting her yeah, to just start realizing that that's where her eyes seem to go when she's looking at a book. There we go. All right. So meet Lena. 
And this is the first time, Lena, I tried to find all my first time book reading videos right. that I have. And um, this, you're going to notice in this video, this little pink thing here. For I am on some Windows based Tobies, I can find the Microsoft Store and buy this particular mouse highlighter, which is great because it gives me the ability to highlight buttons as I'm modeling, you'll see it. And it is so effective in highlighting text because it shows me tracking across the text. So I'm trying to I'm trying to emulate me taking my finger and running across text as I read. I can do it with this thing. But some locations don't have this particular one. So then I'm like stymied and have to look for one that's almost as good. But this one's great. It's called Mouse Highlighter. So that if you wonder what the circle is, it's me. Yes. I know, there's a baby. Baby. Baby, baby. giraffe. Giraffe. Mm -hmm. Just a baby. Baby. And then there's the mom giraffe. She's really tall. Mom. She's really tall. So tall that mom, mom is. That's the mom, exactly. She's so tall. I know, it is so good. She's very big, Lena. You are right. She's very big. She's a very big, tall giraffe. Giraffe? Mm hmm She is. And then the baby. Baby. Baby is not so big. No. Not so big. But I think very cute. So cute that baby is. It's like a shrunken mom. They took the mom and just shrunk her down. <laughs> Not like people. We don't look like shrunken grown-ups when we're babies. We look different. I know. It's kind of amazing. Amazing. The elephants just look like shrunken elephants. I have something else to say. I have something else to say. I know. Here they go. There's mom and... Mm -hmm. Mom and... Mom and her. And we just wait for the grinding and the attention and there you go. And giraffes. I know, we saw it. We saw it. And there's that G for giraffes. G. Giraffes. Mm-hmm. And there it is. There's the mom up at the top. And where's the baby? Way down there at the bottom. I know. Mom's way up and the baby's way down. So her, what I've really worked on with her is that reciprocity is waiting and pausing. She, she, when I first met her, did not look at her device at all. And slowly but surely, I was just like wooing her in. The minute she would look, I would model and just slowly but surely. But when we started reading books, her attention grew like tenfold. She was so interested in the words. Now, do I think she's reading the words? I'm not worried about her reading the words. Right now, I'm worried about her getting her left to right as a motor pattern down. The motor planning visually for left to right is really hard. It's go, 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 stop at midline and then have to start again. That's not very effective in reading. And so once they can get that flow going across, it's just so much easier for them to then start focusing on the words and what they mean. But right now, what she knows about books is they are fun. There's a lot of meaning there. We can have a conversation about them. She can look at me, act things out. She can go and make her comments. She can go and find what I say. Like, I'm like, you know, that mom is up. And I just paused. And sure enough, she looked up where the, where the mom was. I didn't say, find the mom, find the baby, none of that junk because it makes them go nuts in terms of their apraxia, it goes crazy. But it's just this interaction that's, that if you, if you see it, it, it's like when you see it, you know it. You know that's what you want to have happening in that back and forth. Um, and, and she's made so much progress with it. And it's just been, it's just fun. I mean, I think we're both having fun. I think that's what you see in the videos with Courtney and I is the kids are having fun. And not to say they don't have some times where they're going, oh, like, because they want to be done. I'm like, oh my gosh, we just have one more page and then we go. But I try not to have it be anything horrible because I don't want them ever to think that reading is a horrible thing.
it could be a godsend. No. Yeah. Just make it as fun as possible and interactive and and they and they rise to the occasion. Um, they really do. And I think one of the things I, I've noticed is because, again, we have girls across, you know, bo- girls and boys across the gamut of ages. And I do have girls and boys, mostly girls and women who are in their, you know, teens and 20s, that haven't you learned know, to read. who are also emergent readers. Right. And so we're doing playing with books a little bit differently, but we are still doing it with our kiddos who are in their teens and 20s. But one of the things, and I've just now in the past since, um, Ava last year, I have had a couple girls that are at the, at the beginning, you know, very brand new three-year-olds. It's been a while since I've worked with littles and it is amazing to see the, the most important thing I can say is please don't let anybody tell you if you're a parent and they're telling you that there's a hierarchy of communication and they have to do A, B, C, D, E before they get a device. That is not true because I have seen so much growth in my littles starting with a robust communication system at a young age. And I'm like, I cannot believe the amount of communication I'm getting from them, not only, and also just seeing that left to right progression moving along, like all those things are so, I'm really seeing a lot of gains with my kiddos in that area. And also there's no prerequisite for literacy. They don't have to know all their letters before they, those kids did not know all their letters. And they are nope. practice reading a book. And so I think we put up, um, and wow. I'm going to say we because I'm, I'm a fellow teacher. I'm going to say that we put up often barriers to our kiddos learning things because we have somewhere in the back of our mind, somebody told us, you have to do it this way. If that had happened to me, I don't know if I would have learned to, I taught myself to read. I don't even know how I learned to read. I went into kindergarten reading. I have no idea. But if somebody had said to me, you have to know all your letters before you're doing what you're doing, or you're going to have to, you're going to have to trace these letters perfectly before you're doing what you're doing. I would have been thwarted in what I was doing, not helped to do what I was doing better. Did I have to go back and learn some things because I was pretty much self-taught, not self-taught, my mom read to me, but I put it together on my own. And, and I think that, I think we have to say that our kids, I know, learn a lot more by just being in the environment than we think they are learning. And, and if we then say, you have to do A, B, and C before you do this fun stuff over here, it's it, You can teach it in the process. If you noticed with Lena, we got to the giraffe. I pull out my ABC flip book and I point to the G. Now it's embedded in something meaningful. It's not a separate thing. Like the letters are over here and the, the books are over here and the writing is over here. It's all together integrated, um, which is really important. And I love this quote. And even though you found it, I'm going to read it. It's called Reading. It's how people install new software into their brains. And it's so true. I don't think there's one single thing that is more important than reading and writing, particularly for kids who are nonverbal. Really important. Yeah, yeah really it important. It's huge. Yes, huge. So yes. if you have any questions, please email either one of us. You have suggestions for things you want to learn. We are going to do a webinar coming up. I don't know if it's this next month or the month after. Um, we both watched this great webinar that um, Smart, Box did, Smart Box did on the social emotional needs of AAC users. Um, yes. We learned a lot from that webinar and we want to integrate it more into what we're doing. And we'd also like to do a short webinar on it. Um, that I think would be really helpful for parents, teachers, therapists, you name it, anybody working with complex kids and AAC users and or AAC users, it would be really helpful. So um, it has been a pleasure. Um, and if you, I don't know if anybody has any questions right now, we'll kind of break out of this and see if anybody has any questions. They're all so well behaved. Look at that. Uh, we have we've had a lot of comments and so a great com, uh, conversation going in the, the thing um i've given everybody a lot of my email please email me i know you guys have a lot of questions and things like that um melissa we do have some um we do have i know susan has some french books I, that we can possibly share with you i have french books and i will tell you do you speak french melissa they do oh man maybe you and i can get together um i um i don't speak french 
anytime I attempt it, leave laughs at me, but I can model like a whiz bang on a device with French, <laughs> um, with grit. But she is reading and she is, um, and she is um, writing. She's writing because I paired reading and writing so closely together for her because I don't have the decoding skills in French and her school doesn't believe she's capable of learning to read. Um, so I have been kind of muddling my way through it. So I'd love to spend some time having a conversation with you and I will gladly share books. And in terms of how to adapt books, I sat all day because I had no internet and no go to meeting um, doing cleaning up a course that's going up and then after that course is going to be the course on how to build books yes on how to do what we do with books um it's a little complicated yes. depending on it you got to have communicator we cannot do it on a prc so if you have a prc vi device oh. i am like we are not going to be your friend because you I, cannot make a book in a prc I, but on a prc device I tried. You, you cannot it's just crazy but in on a prc device you can put grid and I know how to create books in grid. So that is another way of doing it. So we will be happy to, um, we're gonna be happy to build that course because we've had a lot of requests. Either that or people are just, yes. and, and we have a lot of books. As long as you have a reading A to Z license, we're happy to share our books, so. Yes, we helps. can share them. Okay. And again, you know, um, on our webpage, and we are in the process of cleaning up our, uh, changing around our webpage, but there are free resources, all of our web chats, are up there um, in our a reading specialist in our past life. If we you, love that. <laughs> <laughs> if you go under um, free resources, there are our book club books are up there. Our um, web chats are up there. Our free lessons that we did during COVID are up there. Um, but this web chat will be once we have a uh, recorded. It is big. Can you tell it's getting to the end of the night for me? My Once goodness. Once it has been um, it has exported and sent to Courtney, she will post it on our website. There you go. It's an hour, <laughs> it's an hour later for you than it is for me. So anyways, <laughs> and, and it, truly we answer emails. So yes, maybe that I, it might, it might be, take a couple of days just because we're busy, but right. because it's just Susan and I it might take a couple of days, but please email us. Yes, we, we, we are here to support right, and help. We are. And thank you very much for being with us tonight. We say good night. All right. Be well. All right. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>